Hello everyone, I'm Kevin from the Australian Institute of International Affairs and today I'm joined with Associate Professor Anthea Roberts from the ANU School of Regulation and Global Affairs. Uh, she just finished a very interesting talk with the AIAACT branch asking the question, is international law international? So Anthea, what exactly do you mean when you ask, is international law international? Sure. Well, I think the question that we're used to asking is, is international law law? Because often the question is whether or not it's binding. But uh, as an international lawyer who started in Australia but then moved to the US and UK, I started to notice that there were very different communities of international lawyers that had different understandings and approaches to the field. And it made me start to question not whether international law was law, but whether it was in fact as international and universal as I had assumed it was. And it also started to make me realise that I had been working within three Western English-speaking common law states. So if I was noticing differences in their understanding and approaches to the field, it made me start to wonder how did the field look from the communities of Russian international lawyers or Chinese international lawyers. Was this field that we assumed to be universal really universal and international? Or were there distinct national and geopolitical approaches to international law that I needed as an international lawyer to better understand? I, I see. So is there a particular uh, emphasis in international law on which perspective is most values? Sure. So I think that um, when I started to study this, I, I started off with this idea of difference, that there might be different approaches to international law. And that I certainly found evidence of difference across a whole, a whole range of different issues. But I also found what I describe as the, the pattern of dominance, which is that there were certain national or regional approaches that had played a disproportionate role in helping to define what counted as the neutral international law approach. And across a whole variety of metrics, that tended to be Western approaches in general and Anglo-American approaches in particular, though sometimes Anglo-American and Francophone as well. I see. Depending on the region. And so they were the ones that often were considered to be the international approach in a way that I thought with changing geopolitical power might come under pressure. Oh. So what has been the effect of this, uh, you would call, uh, probably we could call it Western emphasis on Western emphasis, uh, emphasis on Western perspective in international law? In yeah. Look, I think you see, you see it in many different things. So I think one of the things that's happened is that I think many of the international lawyers in the West have assumed that their approach is much more universally followed and believed in than has been the case. So I think that um, it's, it's not a surprise for many people coming from third world states or from non-Western states that things are not as international mm -hmm. as they might appear when you're in the US or when you're in Western Europe. So there's been a, a problem of false universalization of the Western approach. There's mm -hmm. also been, um, with that, a sort of a real emphasis on some of the values within the West. So, for example, I had always taught as an international lawyer that state sovereignty had been paramount in international law, but particularly since the end of World War II, we'd seen a downgrading of state sovereignty and a rise of the individual with human rights and international criminal law and responsibility to protect. I think what we're now starting to see in this sort of recalibration where some of the Western approaches are declining and some of the non-Western approaches are rising is we're seeing a, a much more of a reassertion of a different style of international law that harks back to a stronger emphasis on state sovereignty than we had perhaps expected in the 1990s when there was much more of a unipolar power moment in international law. I see. So what are the implications of this shift uh, in international law and international politics in general? So I think one of the implications of these things is that we are going to be going through a period where power has disaggregated, so some of the Western power is declining, some of the non-Western power is rising. But it's not just that there's a recalibration in that way, it's that the different major powers are actually unlike-minded. And so I think that that's going to mean that we're going to see much more contestation about the international order, because it's not one group of like-minded states that are able to push through an agenda. We're going to have different states with not equal power, but more equal power, with different conceptions, and so we're going to have a much more contested international order which is what I think you're seeing very clearly at the moment. So I think we're going to get less multilateral agreement, we're going to have states retract into themselves more than they did in the 1990s and the 2000s, and I think we're going to see stronger emphasis on nationalisation and state sovereignty than we have previously, and more standoffs on a number of issues. We're going to see standoffs on cyber security, standoffs on the law of the sea, standoffs on trade. I think all of that's very clearly happening at the moment. I, I see.
thank you for being here. Thank you very much. If you wish to know more about international affairs, do go to our website at internationalaffairs.org.au or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.